Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Christian Hofstetter. Based in Biel, Switzerland, Christian is a leadership and team coach who provides organizations with the tools and structures to foster internal change. You can find him on LinkedIn at Hofstetter Christian, and check out his website at hofstetter-coaching.com. Christian is the author of the LeanPub book, Playbook, Navigating Team Toxins. In the book, Christian helps teams and organizations identify and address the toxic behaviors and communication patterns that can damage relationships and hinder productivity. In this interview, we're going to talk about Christian's background and career, his book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience creating content and designing meetings and things like that. So thank you very much, Christian, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. Thank you, Len, for the invitation. Uh, what a surprise to receive an email from you. Oh, well, thank you very much for that. It was also great to see your book show up on, on Lean Pub one day. Uh, I love I love looking at the new releases every day and things like that. And they're, they're just so, so, so sort of, you know, um, uh, clear and sort of cheerful and and uh, productive um so i really like them uh i always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story um so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and uh how you found your way into the career that you've built no oh. so i grew up in a very small town and we had a short conversation about it and i usually explain it in a way like winter starts early and ends late so uh, I'm prepared. My snowplow is ready, tested, ready for for winter, and um, yeah, like the, the, my first memory about kind of um, my professional career. I believe I was like four years old, and I um, accompanied my dad working as an like electrician. Mm. So from the age of four, and you just hey, I, I'm gonna become an electrician. So this was set. I went through school that was more like you know. Uh, to complete it, but it was clear. I, I'm gonna work and become an, as an, uh, an electrician, and this is what I've done. And but the moment I started kind of working on construction sites, I knew, hey, this is a great job. It's something um, manual, and it has to do with technology, which I love. Um, but then I decided to go to university and study the electrical engineering, and. Uh, there was a bit lost, you know. Yeah, you start the electrical engineering. What should you, should you do? And somehow uh, I went to Australia and had this this great um, professor there, and he taught us telecommunications and mobile networks. And this really got me excited in a sense, you know, um, offering communication um, to to a you know to, to a country to a society and. Then I knew I want to become a radio network engineer. This is what I've done. Um, started working as a radio network engineer, but, and then suddenly it got somehow repetitive. And this is a pattern in my life. What I noticed, right? If it gets repetitive, I, I need a change. And somehow I ended up in IT. Um, worked first as a lead engineer, built up uh, so, uh, platforms for mobile networks. And uh, but then I discovered something as uh, something where I'm now consistent on for the past I would say seven years, which I would say is a record for me, which is teaching, facilitating, coaching, just kind of helping people. Um, this is what I'm super passionate about, and I would say ever since I've been working as a as a coach with with individuals, and um, with teams, with organizations, and. Uh, yeah, I'm now at a point where uh, I have a very cool portfolio, which gives me a lot of passion and joy. And every single day, I love to get up, which is, uh, I would say, uh, a record for me, a personal record in a sense. Like every single day, is something that I'm really looking forward to do. And so I, yeah, it's every week is different. Every day is different. Yeah. So it's yeah, human beings in the center point of my life, Kurt. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for that great, great sort of story. Um, uh, I'm really interested in, in talking to you about what you've been doing for the last few years and stuff like that. But just, um, it's interesting. I was looking looking at your LinkedIn before, while I was researching for the interview. So I come from a snowy place myself. I come from um, the province of, it's very flat though. Um, mm -hmm. I come from the province of Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, uh -huh. uh, so, you know, yes, the winters start early and end late. Um, uh you know, minus, minus, minus 40 is a thing that happens there. Yeah. Um, uh, and I was just curious about what it was like. So I see that you went to the University of Adelaide. So you go from like, you know, kind of 
snowy mountain de Switzerland to kind of Western Australia. Uh, what was what was that like? That that was, I would say, a really interesting experience. Also, kind of you know nowadays, like when I was kind of younger, it was just kind of this adventure, kind of sit going to the sea, traveling to a different continent, really going far away from. I would say our very, very safe and kind of isolated place. Uh, I, I grew up, and um, now with kind of a bit of distance, was what is really interesting. It allowed me to break free, break free of kind of the norms and uh, that I just kind of and strategies that that I picked up just to fit into our small society, into uh, into I would say the Swiss, uh, the Swiss culture. Uh, per se, so it just kind of it was also a breaking free free mode for me just to go there to study and you know enjoy the weather, hot temperature, the beach, the sea, um, yeah, which which yeah, is really exciting. Yeah, yeah. The um, I think I know what you mean. The the I mean, for some people, moving away from home is the worst. They're like they they get there like they think they want to do it. They get there and they're like they want to go back. And other people just feel this like thrill of uh, being on your own, um, you know, mm-hmm. for the first time, having to define all your relationships as a stranger uh, to the mm-hmm. people and the place, uh, things like that. And that could, for some people, it's the worst thing. For other people, it's like, wow, what an amazing, <laughs> what an amazing thing. Um, and uh, and so you mentioned that you were for earlier on in your career, you were building mobile platforms. Um, mm-hmm. And I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit about what you mean about that, like where you like. You know, out there putting the tower up on top of the apartment building, or what? What do you mean when you say you were building mobile platforms? So there, there's two parts to it. Like when I was planning the networks, uh, mm. I was sitting in front of a computer. I had maps. I did some simulations. How kind of the coverage of a cell tower could look like and how to make it better. Um, and then the good part was actually when I, uh, I usually picked up my digital cam. Uh, you know, back in the days, we still had the digital cam, so it's not as long as, you know, the, the analog ones. But I, I picked up the camera from the shelf. I got into my uh, company car and just kind of drove out there, drove out there into, I don't know, the the countryside where we were planning the cell tower, looking around, it's just kind of visualizing the map and taking pictures and envisioning how this, this could look like. So this is, these were special moments. Uh, um, this what we call sightseeing. Um, yeah, that's, that's then, so. Please go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry. It's just it's just so interesting. I mean, this, for whenever, whenever you you talk to someone who actually built something, you mm. realize how much you take for granted. You know, so for me, like mobile communications is I bought a phone, and <laughs> and it works, and it works, and I I, I, <laughs> I take that for granted, and I I tap on it, and things happen. Uh, but of course, behind that is an incredible amount of knowledge and mm. learning and, and planning and things like that. Uh, so it's really always very interesting to hear about, you know, the sort of how like someone actually had to pick where that location was for that cell tower in order to and do that. They had to I find somebody who wants this cell tower on his land, but oh, let's not go into politics. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's always that, but you know, someone has to understand the physics of like, what's the what's the range going to be of this particular yeah, installation yeah. given the surroundings and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah so and so is... anyway, but, but, but somehow you managed to transition from being a very kind of technical kind of engineer person mm-hmm. into being, I guess another, Frank, you wouldn't think, think of it as another form of technical engineering, but like coaching and things like that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that happened and what it is that you do now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, after after planning, I joined a, uh, a software development team, and we built up a platform just to configure and manage these cell towers. So we we're collecting the data and just kind of managing the configurations. And after a couple of, I would say, two or three years, we, we built this platform up. It was up and running, and I, I noticed how this experience of kind of following building up a, a team from scratch you know just kind of hiring recruiting new members deciding how we want to work and collaborate together and designing and deciding on our processes celebrating together 
uh, and also kind of, you know, mourning together when the platform died in a sense, um, right? And this this experience of this meta experience, I would say, not from a technical point of view, but really from a, a systems point of view, from a um, human being system point of view, it was so interesting for me. I feel, hey, I want to share that. Um, I want to share that with other teams, with other people within the company, but because somehow I noticed the, the whole company wasn't ready to go through this transformation of changing, kind of making this shift from project management into um, product-centric design, in a sense. And I said, hey, what I went through, this is highly relevant for everyone else at the company. So then I... I I asked a friend of mine, and he was actually starting a internal coaching team, in a sense, interning, internal consulting team within within the company. And uh, I was able to join this team, and ever since, just uh, helping organizations, helping teams, helping leaders in how they should design, plan, and also execute the transformations within their organizations. Yeah, it's um, it's, it's very interesting. There was something kind of that might might to people seem kind of subtle, but like it's actually a very big uh, difference in approach that you mentioned there, which is going from kind of project management mm. to product management. Mm. Um, it's a big, big organizational change, very different focus in sort of what people's responsibilities are and the way they view what they're doing, how you measure mm. outcomes, things like that is like actually, I mean, it's easy to say when you've sort of gone to the other side, but like actually delivering the thing to the people who need it, what do they actually need it? How do they use it? Things like that, as opposed to sort of sitting on top of a project mm-hmm. is a very different approach. Yeah. And for the first, I would say three years, I was, I would say more focusing on these processes that you described very, really, uh, really beautifully right now. And so I was focused, you know, on, on the roles. I was focused on the processes. I was focused on how do you manage the backlog and the work and how did you break down break break down the work into chunks? How did you iterate over it? How you kind of formulate and, and text and describe these requirements? And but then suddenly something changed where I noticed, hey, you know, people usually it it, it takes uh, it took our engineers and the teams. I would say two weeks to get into into this into these processes you know they are engineers they are problem solvers you show them how to do it and they go through the motions and the things they went through the motions but without this this hard with it without passion without understanding most of the time why they were doing what they were doing right and this was somehow where i was still in the same role and i shifted my perspective rather than looking at the processes and the descriptions and the responsibilities and uh, more at how do you estimate work, more at the mechanical things. I was looking at more at the, at the emotional side of it, you know? Uh, do they have a purpose? Do they know their team identity? Who who are they as a team? So are they a machine? I definitely don't believe so. So they are an organism who, who lives and evolves and has needs. So. How can you, can they address their needs? Is there enough psycholog- psychological safety or are just blindly following what the manager is saying, right? Uh, are there conflicts? How, they are, how are they handling and managing these conflicts with the team? So somehow I was shifting my perspective still in the same role, but kind of looking differently as at, at, at these teams and organizations. Yeah, it's something I I got to see you put that so so well, and it's it's something I personally find kind of quite fascinating is that a lot of people think that the hard ass thing is to treat people who are working on something as like interchangeable units, mm-hmm. uh, but they did like for you, you can you can still think of them as interchangeable units if you want, but they're very complex ones. They have their brains; those brains have feelings. Uh, if those brains feelings are motivated to do something, they'll, they'll still be in their job, but they won't be motivated to do it. Wouldn't you rather they be motivated? Wouldn't you rather mm-hmm. they feel empowered to do what they're supposed mm-hmm. to do? Wouldn't you rather they, they really want to be doing what they're doing mm-hmm. and have an understanding of it and things like that? And so focusing on this level of work is not, uh, 
is not a distraction. It's not just about being nice. It's uh, it's about making like that organization exists for a purpose. That team exists for a purpose. Helping them achieve that purpose is really what's going on here. Uh, and it turns out having a happy workforce is a more productive workforce. And this this is exactly my my, my bet, which I fully kind of believe in, and it's it's also like um, nowadays I work usually with bigger organizations, and I am um, I consider myself uh, myself an organizational developer also in that sense. Yeah. So what I tried to create within within our organization of roughly 350 people. So we were a department within a, a big Swiss telco. So they're a really focused on kind of creating a culture where you're per, the human being is really the centerpiece. Um, in, in a sense that you can come to work and also grow as a human being. And not with the company's intention then to sell you for a better price, right? So this is the strategy how consultancies work. They invest a lot of money into you so that you can kind of get additional certificates and so that they can sell you more expensive on the market, which is, I would say, not such a bad eco-cycle in a sense, right? It, it could be sustain more sustainable, but, but still it's already human-centric, maybe with a bit of a commercial point of view, right, to earn more money. But my my question, my big question is, you know, what if, what if the, the purpose of of a corporate nowadays would also be to that they have a benefit or that they contribute towards society in a sense where if you come to work, you can grow, you can develop yourself, you can become a better version of yourself if you want that, right? It's an offer. It's not I'm I'm not forcing you Len to do that, right? This doesn't work. This is already would probably create the opposite of my intention, but hey, Len, come to work, come work with us and you can develop, you can grow. And if it's time for, if, if then it's the right time for me, for you, you can move on. I don't care if you leave the company, but if you take the next step, feel more empowered, uh, have more passion, have more to join what you do, then I would say I, I, I've won. And this is how I, trying to act every single day to create such a space within within organizations and and, and teams so. and for um for people listening who've maybe never had that experience at work of having someone like like you around as as a resource and active um you know so let's say let's say for example let's take maybe even people who are listening are have never been a programmer or something like that but you can imagine what a programmer does you know they they sort of have a desk they have a computer they have a keyboard and a screen and they're given instructions like write some co code to make this happen, right? How do you come in then to that picture? Um, usually I come in in, in two ways. E either one way is like a team, a team calls for me and we say, hey, we need somebody from the outside to support us. And then uh, most teams I work nowadays with, um, so... I, I'm I'm self-employed, but I also work for a uh, for for a company. So I have like both sides to it. But in both cases, usually these teams they have already somebody in 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 a team who kind of looks at the processes and also at focus on the facilitation, making the team succeed, like in easy terms, right? Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's it's helpful to bring in somebody from the outside, create such a space. Well, uh, most of the time, vulnerable, vulnerable spaces. Where we really can, where people can address what is worrying them, uh, if they have frustration, and um, sometimes also some, some grievance, people died, or just kind of, there's there's a lot a lot going on, right? Or they are struggling to perform as a team, right? So I come in, and I offer them, and most of the things I do, or everything I do, is always an invitation. I offer them just to look at it with a from a different perspective, a perspective they would not look at. Because all other perspectives, you know, the rational one, the analytical one, they looked at it because this is where they are really good at, right? Where they're usually the best in their field also. But then most of the topics, all the problems that they can't solve nowadays, they are not rational. A, they are emotional or political 
or it's about egos or it's about whatnot. It's, it's not something that makes sense, right? It's something that you can sense, that you can feel sometimes hard to express. But you just can't put just a stamp on and say, okay, we're going to fix that with a wrench, right? So it needs a bit looking a bit into, into the depth. So this is kind of one, one scenario I would, I would come in. And the other side is what I, what I noticed, um, most corporates that I worked with or worked for, and um, when they look at leadership, it's really on a, usually leadership is the same as management. To me, there's there's a difference. For me, as leadership, if you are passionate about something, if you feel take ownership for a technical component, for the architecture, if you take ownership for, um, for I don't know a piece piece of software, a piece of code, then for me, you are a leader because you take responsibility. It's not given to you, but you claim it, right? So, and. With these engineers, with these coders, with these developers, they they usually be very driven and very passionate. So what I offer them are leadership programs, um, which more like for I would say eighty five percent focus on themselves, right? So for me, leadership starts with yourself. So I coach them, I create programs, half year programs with them, where we look at themselves, where I offer them. A lot of introspection. So these are two things that I usually try to help teams and people. Yeah, that's that's a that's a really great description, and I love this sort of importance. You know, this sort of I set up the kind of like kind of neutral, kind of like simple, kind of like if you think that all you're doing is sitting in front of a computer and typing, you don't understand actually what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, sort of taking a step back and thinking, oh, like I'm a person in a position who like can actually take ownership of what's happening. I can be passionate about what I'm doing, things like that. Going through those exercises to kind of step back and be really important for your own, for your own well-being and for your productivity as well. Um, and, uh, the, the sort of the, the book or pamphlet that we're here to talk about today is navigating team toxins playbook, mm -hmm. which is an interesting, it's so interesting when I remember when I saw that, cause it's like, okay, what are we going to do today? We're going to focus on all the bad stuff. Um, <laughs> You know, like, it's kind of like, what a, what a challenge. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Navigating Team Toxins playbook, who it's for, what, what it is, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. what it's meant to address and, and how mm -hmm. it's meant to address mm -hmm. the, those problems. Maybe when I start, if, if I start from, from the beginning, kind of when I, a couple of months ago, I, I reflected a bit on my journey where I've started and how I kind of grow and kind of mistakes I've made, but the things were also succeeded. And what I noticed was, was a pattern, a pattern of elements, structures that I, over this course of kind of this past seven years, I constantly used them over and over and, and over again. And these, this, these team toxins is something, this concept of team toxins is something that I learned a couple of years ago in a, in a systems coaching class, uh, organization and relationship systems coaching course. And basically what it does, it, it creates a common language, right? So if you speak with a Java developer, right, then you, in Java, you have this domain specific language, right? You have functions, you have public, you have class, you have variables and strings. It just kind of turns that you know we, a language that you can speak if you know Java, right? So think of team toxins exactly the same, a language for conflict and toxic behavior mm -hmm. in a team. Mm -hmm. Because if you can name it, you can tame it. Uh, I can't recall who this uh, quote is from, but uh, maybe Brene Brown or just kind of so, so yeah. a big name out there. But it's exactly that. If you can, if you can name it, you can start to talk about it. And this is basically what this intervention is for. And the playbook, the, the idea for this playbook came like, hey, I've, I've learned so much from the community in, in these past seven years. I, I learned, I was able to learn from some really um, experts in, in, in the field. And I thought, hey, why not 
something small from my side to give back. Something um, in a sense that you can take one and in, in the best case, you can do it yourself uh, and facilitate and just kind of um, facilitate your team through through this process. This, this is this is the idea behind behind the playbook, and also with your then with your team, develop such a language. And this is my perspective on how I can scale my work, my impact in the world by creating something that somebody can replicate, tweak, um, bring their own twists in, and you know applying their teams. So this is this is the idea of the of the playbook. Yeah, it's it's uh, that's so so well said. Uh, if you, if you if you can if you can name it, you can tame it. And it's the, the sort of idea of a shared language. And I love the idea that you sort of start over. Like like there's programming languages have names for things. Um, for teamwork, we can have names for things. Um, mm -hmm. And you know that's like a really sort of like special insight. And so for example, one can be if you're having a discussion and you go, oh, what's going on? I'm just looking at your bed at the playbook here. You know, oh, this is an exist. This is an example of blaming. Mm -hmm. Right. What's going on here is blaming. Is that useful in the pursuit of our actual goal uh, to be engaged in the activity of blaming? Probably not. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, and then you offer these antidotes to the kind to, to these kinds of things, which is like really useful. Mm -hmm. And having people go through go through these exercises for thinking about basically, yeah, the kind of like what are the names for the behaviors that we engage in? Are they actually useful? How can we address them? Uh, is just a really really useful useful sort of way to think about it, and then to actually go through the practical experience of like, well, here's the, here's, there's, there's team toxins. Um, there's, and then there's other things that one can address as well and sort of just take some time every once in a while to think about the system that you're operating in yourself through right. language and behavior, uh, is really important in addition to sort of whatever the actual work you're doing is, which is if it's driving out and taking pictures to put up cell towers. If it's coming back and reporting on that, if it's sitting down and coding, things like that. Um, uh, just before we we go on to talk a little bit about how you how you create your your content and things like that, um, so you mentioned so so you both work for a company and you do consulting on your own, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so if, if anyone's interested in working with you, what's what personally, what's the kind of experience they can expect, or what could they be looking for to get from working with you? Um, definitely something I, I I offer, and I believe that I'm I would say really good at or just kind of yeah I'm, I'm i'm really good at is creating connection so this connection between people um this 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 trust something i noticed i i can create such a space where people can be really vulnerable and, and open up right and kind of also let down their professional facade right so my, my professional facade is um i want to also here in the podcast, you know, I want to look as, as an expert coach. I want to look um, that I know what I do, uh, that people want to come to me and that I never make mistakes, right? So this is usually the prof professional facility that we all put up, right, in our our day to day work. And somehow I I I I manage it that people can soften up and also show, you know, where they fuck up. Where they are where they are maybe not as brilliant as they want to let others seem, where they also share a bit about their their backstory, the things that they leave at at home. So I would say this is something that that makes me special and usually and where I usually have also the biggest impact in slowing a bit down, looking at problems from a different perspective, and really kind of driving also corporate culture forward through through leadership i would say through leadership training in a sense because that you need to understand that leadership i would say is one of the most important aspects within within companies within teams within corporates and that it starts with yourself so if you want to have more impact as a leader you have to start with yourself understand how you function, what triggers you, but are you afraid of what are the things that you are running away from then, right? Mm -hmm. And if you understand that, if you understand your patterns, if you understand your strategies that made you a successful person today, you know how you even can become, I would say, more successful. I don't know if this is really the goal, but it really have more impact um, to the people around you because this 
I would say is the most valuable thing is if we can help other people, if we can even help the society and, and the world. So this is what I, what I, what I bring in. Yeah, that's so, that's so great. Um, the, uh, in the last part of these interviews, um, because some of the people who listen are sort of interested in creating content themselves, they might be an author, they might be a consultant, <laughs> things like that. I, we actually like to get into the weeds. So you've got these really nice PDFs. Um, <laughs> what tools did you use to make them? Uh, and you've got like you know, these really nice cards and things like that, that people can print out. What just, what tools do you use to, to create your, your stuff? So my, at the really, at the beginning of my, um, kind of production process, is is Trello. So I, I um, a, fr a, fr a friend of mine, Barry Overeem, um, he kind of started with it and started to create uh, playbooks, uh, not playbooks, um, uh, scripts for workshops in, in Trello. And I, I noticed how flexible you can be with Trello, just kind of reorder things like, oh, okay, this is now for the options. Ah, I want to put it in this element, by it. So this is where I started to sketch my, my book. In, in in Trello, in a sense, okay, what are what are the steps that people need to go through? What is the purpose of the book, um, of, of the playbook? What do I hope to achieve with it? So this is where where I started, and then as a um, as a non English native speaker, I'm I'm he I heavily referred to Grammarly now for one, one or two years, um, which is a really cool plugin that I use to kind of just m make my texts better. It also proposes how I could rewrite something, make it easier to understand. It offers uh, synonyms. So this I use kind of for, I would say, for the text quality. And um, yeah, just to really have professional looking texts, uh, even as a, yeah, not, not well, as an English writer expert. And when I, when I had that, I then kind of moved over to um, first, I used a, um, a Trello to PDF generator that a friend of mine programmed. Oh, but somehow it's it kind of it looked like their company. So um, the concept is really ingenious, right? So you write your book in Trello, and then you have a, a markdown to a PDF generator. Uh, okay. Basically the same as Leanpop works more or less, right? Mm. And then it's hey, it didn't look like my stuff, my thing. So I went on Fiverr. I asked a designer oh. I worked in the past with. Just to create me a bit of uh, a bit of layout, how the pages could look like, a couple of templates, and then I used these uh, Adobe InDesign files. I imported them in Canva, Canva.com, oh, yeah, which is like a, a tool for amateurs for uh, for design uh, to design stuff. But I use Canva for everything that I do for my for these playbooks. Now I use them for my uh, social media content, and it's just easy right i don't have to be a, an expert in uh, any of the adobe products and uh it's it just works it does its job so this is my production chain from trello using grammarly to improve the texts and then copying it um into canva in my canva templates canva.com and from there exporting it to pdf thanks very much for that really great explanation that was just so clear and coherent uh, and like, you know, for, it's, it's sort of interesting. It's like when so much work goes into figuring out every step of the way in processes yeah. like that, like interacting with Fiverr, finding someone on there, for example, I'm sure that was like a, its own whole thing. Uh, and, uh, and it's just so great to actually hear, I mean, it can save people so much time and, and also give them a sense of like, you know, it's, it's a, the, the, it's a journey to producing things. Uh, exactly. I spend also so much time on understanding lean pop. So this is just kind of. You know, you understand the concept of lean, of iterating, right? This is also where the, the idea, I would say, from, from Lean Pop is coming from. Um, so my big dream is to write my own book. And then I ask myself, hey, how can I make, because writing a book is such a big thing, how can I make it smaller? So then I actually, a friend of mine came up with the idea, hey, Chris, why don't you do some white papers? I said, hey, great idea. So now every chapter is going to be a, a, a playbook in a sense right and then my next step i'll, I'll definitely then use github for the the typesetting the markdown and then just kind of using the automation into lean pop then for the for for the book i would say so this is my master plan that totally makes sense that's so interesting i didn't know that oh that's so great um that's so interesting 
Uh, the the um the last question I have uh, for guests if they've got something up on Lean Pub is uh, always if there was one magical feature we could build for you, or if when you're interacting with Lean Pub there's been something that you've been shaking your fist going damn you Lean Pub <laughs> that is so frustrating if there's something like that that we could fix for you uh, what would you ask us to do? Mm-hmm. That, that, that's a great question, and I don't know if I have. And so I don't have a kind of a, a, a really a big feature request, but when I look at my master plan, something I haven't figured out yet, and probably I'll um, I'll be figuring it out as an engineer, right? Is yeah. <laughs> I want to solve problems, but yeah. how how can I come from my uh, markdown in, in in GitHub to a a book with the look and feel? how I have it more or less today. Maybe not as colorful, right? So this is kind of easy, I would say, for a, a playbook, and I decided outside. But I really want to use the the, the Lean Pub features to, to get it done. But And then also kind of to let it be printed, because this is what it's all about, to have you know, right. your own really? printed book. Okay, okay. So just this is for me still a black hole, and yeah. I'll, I'll definitely figure it out, uh, like because I'm really happy with the documentation on the... Uh, your markdown language that you have. So yeah. no no wishes from my side. More as like, I'm super excited to figure it out all those out the, the next step to get from from GitHub to the book who looks not like a LaTeX document from my uh, university day. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. But more like a, 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 a book. So this is the big question I have in mind. Yeah, the, um, maybe, maybe the one thing I can tell you about that you might not know about is that we do have a full bleed feature if you're writing in in markua like our sort of markdown for books yeah in markua yeah you know? which means that the full page is an image so the mm-hmm. image isn't just within a boundary on the page but you could actually have the whole thing be an okay image. so that might be something that i'm just because this yeah. Uh, uh, yeah so I, I actually i it's on me to make a make a sort of um uh help center kind of explanation of that and probably an explainer yeah. video or something like that uh, but that that's actually a kind of hidden thing that's actually it looks awesome when you when you see it you know it's sort of in action in in a, in a book okay. um, and the other thing that i should mention too is we do have like we have a publish on amazon service that we've we develop we're, we're still developing we've got a few early adopters but the uh, idea okay. is i've written a book on lean pub and i want mm-hmm. to click a button and you guys yes. go put it in print yes um, so we, we do, we, we do have that feature. Uh, cool. Great to know. Now, um, of course you can do it all. You could do it. You could do it on your own. Um, but the idea is like, look, I don't like, here's what I want. My book in print. I, and also not to have to learn anything about how that works. Uh, so let me click a button, pay some money and lean will do that. So anyway, so we're, we're, we're working on that and it's, it's sort of a very interesting challenge. Um, but anyway, yeah, full bleed. Uh, might might be actually very useful for for the kind of ah uh, cool thanks thanks for the, yeah. th- thanks for the tip this is like I would say really the holy grail is to have not even to sell the book this I don't care about it at all but to have my own printed book in my own hand and I I notice how how I'm smiling and getting warm so this is really also what I'm and we actually then called myself an author because you know these three pamphlets how pamphlets how you called them or playbooks you know baby steps mm-hmm. and, and no, that's, that's the, I mean I, I gotta say like you've I mean you're taking like exactly the right approach right like think it through but keep in mind that you're going to be iterating you know it's going to be a process it's going to take some time but like having that that sort of like goal at the end like one day you're going to have that book in your hands and it's going to be mm-hmm. awesome, and you're going to be mm-hmm. able to share it with people and things like that. Mm-hmm. They're going to be able to buy it if they want it. Um, mm-hmm. It's just it's just such a great thing. Uh, well, Christian, uh, thank you very much for taking some time out of your. I, I assume it's the evening, <laughs> or I know it's the evening. <laughs> thank you some time out of your evening uh, in beautiful Switzerland uh, to talk to me and to talk to all of us. And thank you very much for uh, choosing LeanPub as a platform for your work. Thank you, Len.